Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. It is great to be gathered together to worship. I know in addition to everybody that's here in person, we have a group online that joins us every week and we are grateful for you joining us online as well. As we get started, I do have some updates for you on our prayer list and a couple of announcements. On our prayer list, A.J. Glover, this is a 15-year-old cousin of Judy Burrow, has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. We've been asked to remember A.J. in our prayers. And Linda Butler, a former member, has stage 4 lung cancer that has spread to her brain. We've been asked to remember her and her daughter Kay in our prayers. Several of you will know them. And Dominique Thomas, this is a football player at Union College in Kentucky. He plays football for a close family friend of the Steelys. Uh, he lost his mother and both grandparents in uh, the tornadoes in Alabama and has a sister in ICU. And uh, so they just put out a request that we would pray for Dominique and, and certainly want to pray for all those that are dealing with the aftermath of the storms uh, that have gone through. And again, that's just a, a good time to remind us I am grateful for the work that we do with Disaster Relief, with Churches of Christ Disaster Relief. They are mobilizing and ready to help with that, and, and it's a way to make a real difference. And I'm grateful that we get a chance to do that but we certainly want to pray for those folks. Activities, we want to just say a quick thank you to the McIndoo's and the Terry's for putting together and hosting the Easter egg hunt yesterday. Had 58 folks out there and just a really good time, and the Lord provided good weather, so that was great as well. And uh, just thankful for a, a chance to get to do that. Coming up, there will be a come-and-go wedding shower for Kelly McIndoo and Mason Douglas on Sunday, April the 11th. That'll be from 1.30 to 3 in the basement. They are registered at Bed Bath & Beyond and Geppetto's Floral and Gifts. There is going to be a table in the lobby starting this Wednesday. If you're unable to attend the shower but would like to leave a gift, you can do that there. Those are all the announcements that I've got this morning. Again, it is great to see everybody here and to have folks joining us online as well. Leading us in our worship service, Mark Springer will have our opening prayer. Brandon Bridges is our song leader. Scott Shu will have our Lord's Supper devotional. Sam Wood will read scripture. I'll have our sermon, and Bob McIndoo will have our closing prayer. If there's nothing further, Brandon, let's begin our worship. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we're able to come together as a church on this beautiful Lord's Day. Father, we're thankful and as we ask as David steps before us this morning and presents his lesson that we are able to clear our minds of the things of this world. We will have an open heart and an open mind to the lesson he's going to present us and that we will take this lesson and we will walk out of here this morning. We will take it unto the world, we'll 
share it with those that we work with. We will share it with our family. We will continue to be a shining beacon to those around us. Father, we want to thank you this morning for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We understand that all that we have is through you. We're thankful for our homes, for our families. We're thankful for this building that we have, that we are able to come together and meet, lift our voices in praise and study your word. Father, we're thankful for the, the men like David and Josh who, who devote their lives and they come before us each week and deliver your message. We're thankful for those elders and deacons we have that uh, work so diligently to, to uh, grow this church. Father, we ask that you continue to be with those this morning that we've mentioned as sick and those that lost loved ones. We ask you to uh, embrace those, watch over them. We ask these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. this time in the service we will commemorate the agonizing death that Jesus suffered on our behalf so that we could be with him one day in heaven. Let's all clear our minds of all of our worth worldly problems and all of our worldly pleasures and, and focus on just exactly what that meant to, to us when he, when he suffered and died on the cross. Before we give a prayer, let's pull back and top off the bread and, and we'll give thanks for it. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you sent Jesus to this earth to be a sacrifice for our sins. Father, we could never understand truly what Jesus went through on that day, but we know it was a very agonizing thing, and, and he did it so unselfishly because he, of our love, the love that he has for us. Father, we're so thankful that he had that. As we take this bread, we pray that we will continue to remember what he did for us on that day. It's his name we pray. Amen. The 
We'll also give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We'll peel the top back on that and have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you again so thankful for Jesus and and thankful for the for the life that was shed for us and his blood that was shed. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we we pray that we will be mindful of the blood that was shed for us and spilled for our sins so that they may be washed away. It says, in his name we pray. Amen. We put them in a plastic bag provided and pass them to the outsides. That concludes the Lord's Supper, and at this time, out of convenience, we give thanks for the offering that we make according to how we have prospered. Let's go to God in prayer for that. Father, we're so thankful that we live in this community, in this country, that we can have means of support for ourselves and our families, and and we've prospered, and, and we pray that we will be unselfish in giving and, and give back to the to the church to, to bring forth your word and spread the gospel all around the world. Father, we pray that the the elders and of the church would use this money wisely to promote your word and, and spread Jesus' name throughout the world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all all get to heaven. What a day! What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout and shout the victory. reading comes from Mark chapter 14 verses 60 through 62 and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus saying do you answer nothing what is it these men testify against you but he kept silent and answered nothing again the high priest asked him saying to him are you the Christ the son of the blessed Jesus said I am and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power in coming with the clouds of heaven. Man, what a great day it has already been. Thank you so much for being here. Sam, thank you for that reading. Brandon, fantastic job with with our singing. It's just been a a great day to worship together, and I am grateful that uh, we're gathered here and grateful to have folks that join us online as well. 
Also want to say a thank you. Josh and Emily have put together a group of folks who are mentoring our young people. And our mentors are meeting with their folks regularly. And I know we've had some of those meetings already this weekend and different ones that are working that out. And I'm just grateful to those of you that are pouring yourself into uh, our young people and making that investment. I love to see how this church just loves on, on each other and serves. And it is just a great church family to be part of. So again, welcome this morning. As I thought about what I wanted to talk about this morning, what we were looking at, I was just struck by a memory, and it took me a minute to figure out why I remembered my grandmother's pound cake that she used to make. Grandmother's pound cake was legendary. My granddaddy was a preacher, and one year, a grandmother and granddaddy made a pound cake for every family in the church. Don't get any ideas, but uh, they, they did that, and it, it was really appreciated. That was her signature dish. You know, people have a certain dish everybody looks for. Oh, you know, sister so-and-so brought this to a church meal or that. Grandmother's was her pound cake. And the cool thing about having her as my grandmother was you could walk into their house and smell and you knew. I mean, there's a certain way the kitchen smelled. The whole house would smell like her pound cake. And, and there was a certain look she'd get on her face when she was, was bringing it out. There was a certain way that she would smile because she knew exactly what was about to happen. And she would sit that pound cake down. There was nothing like it when it was still just a little bit warm. And she'd serve that, and I can remember how it was still just warm enough. It, it could warm a plate just a little bit. And you'd take that bite, and, and I remember how it felt on your tongue and how it tasted. And as I, I prepared for a lesson on the trial of Jesus, I thought, why am I thinking about grandmother's pound cake so much? And it's because it just takes me a moment to be right back there and experience it. And maybe for you, when you hear a good story, a good storyteller who, who kind of tells you about it, and all of a sudden they tell you how it smelled and how it looked and how it felt and how it tasted, and, and, and you feel like I'm in that story right there. And, and there's an amazing thing that, that happens when you hear a good story. It triggers the same response in your brain as if you were there. Somebody who says, man, I walked in, and, and there were warm chocolate chip cookies in the oven, and that smell just went all through the house. And Y'all are getting hungry now. That's all right. You know what happens when you hear that story? You know why you get hungry? Because the, the olfactory co cortex in your brain, I had to look that one up, the, uh, the smelling part of your brain gets triggered. It's almost as if you were doing it. Now, the neat thing is when a good storyteller tells that story, their smelling part of their brain gets triggered too. So we're all experiencing it together. In a good story, we share in that story. It's as if we were there. And as you hear the story of the greatest event in history, it's designed so that we can put ourselves there, so that we can be part of it. We've been talking some about coming back strong and looking at lessons we learned. And we went all the way back to the baptism of Jesus when, when the heavens were parted and, and God said, this is my beloved son. And some of y'all noted, I, I misquoted that part. It's at the Mount of Transfiguration. He finishes that and says, listen to him. But there is baptism. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And, and we go through Jesus's ministry. We talked about that triumphal entry. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. And you can hear the crowd chant that as Jesus goes in, rides right up to the temple, cleanses the temple. We didn't cover all of this part, but in the intervening chapters, Jesus has eaten that last supper in an upper room with his disciples as they celebrated Passover in a unique way. Jesus changed it up a little bit. Judas got up and left early. We've been to the garden of Gethsemane as Jesus just says, watch and pray. And he goes on a little ways off from them. And he prayed so hard that sweat like drops of blood fell from him. And Judas showed back up. Except when Judas showed back up, he brought guards with him. They came with torches and weapons and they surrounded everyone. And Judas kissed Jesus in the ultimate act of betrayal. And Jesus is arrested. And he's taken in the middle of the night to the house of the high priest where it just so happens coincidentally everybody is already gathered. And Mark chapter 14 kind of picks up the story a little bit. It says, but Peter followed him at a distance, 
right into the courtyard of the high priest. And, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. This wasn't just any old campfire, a bunch of wood. This was a, a specific word that talked about a, a charcoal, almost like a charcoal grill, we would think. It's a charcoal brazier that would be set up out there, several of them. It was great for warming yourself, and so they would stand all around it there. And Peter gets comfortable outside, warming himself by that fire. It says, now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I'll build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. They're trying to twist Jesus' words against him. But even now, they can't seem to get their testimony to agree. And through it all, Jesus stays completely silent. Notice, they lie about him again and again. They, they twist his own words, and never once does he open his mouth. Verse 60, the reading we had this morning, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And it's that question that shakes Jesus loose. It's that question that breaks through that wall of silence that he's built up. Through it all, he had stayed quiet. He had fulfilled that prophecy from Isaiah 53 in verse 7 that says he was silent before his accusers. But now he can't stay silent. Jesus can't fail to answer this question because it would be lying if he let this question go unanswered. And so in verse 62... He said, I am. That, that's the answer. I am. Which if you're a, a good Bible student, you know is also the divine name of God. In Hebrew, Yahweh simply means I am. Jesus says, I am. And in case you missed it, in case somehow that didn't click for you being there in the room for those priests and scribes and Pharisees and all those religious officials. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. You say, that's a weird thing for him to say. But it's almost a direct quotation from Daniel chapter 7. Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He's fulfilling prophecy left and right. We looked last week and saw how he intentionally fulfilled prophecy because Jesus is not just a promise maker. He is a promise keeper. And so even now when he answers that question, he goes back to those Old Testament prophecies and he says this is what God was talking about. They missed it though. Verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? Can't get them to agree anyway. What further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then, then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Jesus is beaten right there in the courtroom. Before the trial is even over, it is... Obvious that this trial was rigged. Before anybody even left to the garden to go get Jesus, the verdict on the trial was already in. There was never anything fair about it. Jesus was on trial officially, but truthfully, it's those religious leaders who are on trial. They just don't realize it. And we've been tracking this scene inside the high priest's house. And now the, the music changes and we move outside and we go back out to that courtyard because John is watching inside the house. He had gone in. He's able to kind of stand there. He is known to the high priest. And so John is watching inside. Judas, meanwhile, is racked with guilt and trying to figure out what he's going to do about it. Nine disciples have scattered and Peter is all by himself out in the courtyard. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. 
And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him. And she said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch. <laughs> and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again. And began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you're a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. You see, in the courtyard, another trial is happening. In the courtyard, it's about Jesus as well. As Jesus is inside the house confirming exactly who he is. Are you the Christ? I am. Out in the courtyard, Peter's denying that he even knows the man. And when he denies that he knows the man, he's denying everything that he's been through for the last three years. All that he's heard, all that he's seen. Peter who built himself up. Lord, even if everybody falls away, I'll never fall away. I'll, I'll die for you. Peter's built himself up. And we give Peter a hard time. And we read this story and we see what Peter does and we kind of cluck our tongue and shake our head and say, poor, poor Peter. But he's the only one in that crowd that's taking the risk. Eleven disciples are elsewhere. Peter's the one who's right there sitting amongst the enemy taking all the danger. John is safe in the house. He's watching from the shadows. Nine disciples are just gone. Judas has betrayed, and Peter has gotten as close as he's allowed, and he's stuck sitting with the enemy. And he's following Jesus now, even all alone. He's following Jesus just like he promised. Even if they all scatter, I'll be there. See, I'm here, Jesus. The courtyard is as far as they'll let me go, but I'm here. And then it all falls apart. When that servant girl looks at him and she looks again, and maybe Peter ducks his head just a little bit and she kind of looks down and she says, hey, aren't you one of, no, no. And he goes outside and she follows him outside and she starts telling other people, look at him, isn't he, I think he's one of them. And finally, they confront him to the point that Peter begins to curse and swear and demand that he doesn't know anything about this guy. And verse 72 says, a second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. You see, if we miss the trial in the courtyard, we'll miss the beauty of God's grace. Jesus' trial inside was a mockery of justice so that... You and I could be justified. Jesus was abandoned so that we would never be abandoned. He was rejected so that we would be accepted. He died so we could live. But where are we in the story? Where, where do you and I fit in this story? Where's our place? Well, we're right out there in the courtyard. The night is cool and the fire's warm and you can smell the charcoal briquettes and they burn your nose just a little bit. And the wind shifts and you move to avoid the smoke and you keep your head down because you don't really want anybody to notice you too much. There's lots of conversations, but they're all kind of low because everybody's waiting for news from the big house. And we have the best of intentions. We're going to follow Jesus. We'll follow Jesus even if nobody else does. We'll follow Jesus even if our life is on the line. We'll follow Jesus. We'll stay faithful in college even when all of our friends give up on their faith. We'll be faithful during the week when, when all those other folks pretend like they never even heard of church. We'll even be faithful on Friday night and Saturday night when all of our friends are having all their fun and we say no because we have good intentions right up until it falls apart. And then we deny Christ. How do we do that? We deny Christ when we put anything ahead of him as Lord in our life. In that moment, we get scared. In that moment when we think, oh no, what am I going to do? And something becomes more important than our dedication to the Lord. We might never deny Jesus with our lips. We might never say what Peter said. I don't know the man. 
but we do it every time we put something else first. We say, Lord, you come first in my life. And then we look at our bills and we look at our money and we say, how am I going to give? God, you're first in my finances, but maybe not this week. Stimulus money comes in and maybe we don't even think about giving off of that. Or we think about it, but we think about all the other stuff we need to do with that money. God, you're first in my finances, but we, we say, I, I plan to give. I'm going to give at just as soon as. God, I put you first in my money, but. Or maybe it's not money. Maybe it's relationships. God, I love you, but I also love her. I also love him. And you know, God, I'm going to have to step aside from my faith for just a little bit. I need to take a little break from church because they won't understand that part of our relationship. And so I'll be back, but I need to go date him or date her. If you have to step away from God to date somebody, that's idolatry. And let me just tell you, this part's free, no extra charge. If you have to step away from God in dating, you'll run away from God in the marriage, guaranteed. We say, you know what, God, my, my marriage, my family, I've got to put them first right now. And so I'll be back as soon as the kids are grown. I'll be back as soon as I love you, but it's idolatry. It's putting anything ahead of God. And if you miss that, you'll never even realize you're doing it. We'll never realize that we're denying Christ, that we put Jesus off in a different room from us and we go out and we get comfortable and warm ourselves up by whatever feels comfortable. You know, if your schedule doesn't allow you to have time for Jesus, then you're a slave to your schedule, and it's idolatry. If you're too busy for the Lord and for his church, then something is more important than God in your life. Parents, and I'm with you on this one, all right? My toes are sore from just studying on this. But parents, if we put our kids in school and extracurricular activities ahead of the Lord and church. Not only are we practicing idolatry, we're teaching our kids to practice it too. We're teaching them that some things are more important than the Lord. And if we skip out on God and our commitment to him because the weather's pretty and the fish are biting, or we might be able to get an early tea time, we're idolaters who put our own comfort ahead of the Lord. You see the picture of Peter by the fire? Being comfortable. That's us. That's us when we deny Christ. And it's crazy because here's the amazing thing. We would say our idols are almost always good. Peter would say it's a good thing I'm here. It's a good thing I'm following Jesus. And he would even say it's a good thing that I'm trying to take care of myself. You know, they'll kill me if they find out. Our idols are almost always good, but when we seek them instead of seeking the Lord, they become idols and not a good thing in our life. And we might tell ourselves, well, you know what? This is just how life works. This is just the phase of life I'm in. This is just what everyone does. But no, if it doesn't line up with God's word and God's will, it's wrong. And I end up in the courtyard denying that Jesus is my Lord. You want some conviction on this one? Just take a look at your phone. And somewhere in there, maybe buried deep if you can help it, is a setting that'll tell you your screen time. It's a setting that'll tell you how many times you pick up your phone. And I made a promise when I put that in my sermon notes that I would look at that number and I would tell you all what it says. I average 83 pickups a day. Some of y'all are horrified by that and some of y'all are going, that's all? I get 125 notifications a day on my phone. 125 times every day my phone says, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. How much time do we spend on social media? How much time do we, do we spend watching TV or streaming? And there's nothing bad about any of that. There's nothing wrong. Some of those 125 notifications are my Bible plan saying, hey, you need to make sure and read me today. Or, hey, somebody commented on the Bible plan. Some of those things are really good. But how many times do I pick up God's word? each day? How much time do I spend reading my Bible and praying? And if I compare those numbers, who's on the throne of my life? Who's in charge? 
who's the king of my life. You say, whew, I'm glad I came to church today. I needed that. Thanks so much for making me feel really good about myself. Is there any good news, David? All oh, there is. There's grace. There's grace. We're not stopping there, okay? Because Peter's story doesn't end in the courtyard. It all falls apart there that night. And the last time we saw Peter, he was weeping because of it. But Christ died the death that we deserve so that he could give us grace. Three times Peter said, I don't know Jesus. But that's not the last picture of Peter. In John chapter 21, Peter's fishing. He said, you know what? I'm going back to what I know. I'm going fishing. He's fishing. Some of the disciples have gone with him. And Jesus shows up on the shore. And John tells us that Peter is so excited to see Jesus, he just jumps in and swims to shore. Tells the rest of them, y'all get the boat in. I'm going to go see Jesus. And he swims to shore and he comes up out of the water and he's all dripping wet. And probably this would be early in the morning because they fished at night. And as Peter comes up on the shore, David's interpretation of the story is at some point he freezes because the wind shifts just a little bit and Peter catches a whiff of charcoal. And he realizes that it's one of those charcoal fires that Jesus is standing beside. It's one of those that, that very distinctive, just like Peter had been warming himself around. In fact, if you read your New Testament, it's the only two times that type of a fire is mentioned. Once in the courtyard and once on the beach. That's it. And Peter catches that smell of charcoal and he remembers that night. And he remembers the last time that he smelled those charcoal briquettes. And what happened next? But then he smells something else because Jesus is cooking breakfast on that charcoal gr grill. Jesus has breakfast ready for him. And Peter sits around the fire and warms himself with the one who provides true warmth and true comfort. It's grace. And Jesus looks him in the eye and asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And Peter is restored. He's restored to the Lord, but Jesus makes sure and restores him to the church too. He says, you've got work to do, Peter. Feed my sheep. And it's not long after this that Peter stands up in front of a crowd and he preaches an amazing gospel sermon, and thousands of people get saved. Not because of Peter, but because of the power of the gospel. But Peter had lived that power before he ever preached it. You see, the shame we feel when we get uncomfortable about who sits on the throne of our life, when we get uncomfortable about what we put in front of God, it ought to drive us right back to the one who can do something about it. You see, if you feel kind of weighty, if you look at that and say, I, I'm in trouble. If you start thinking about your life and say, oh no, I'm going straight to the bad place because I've got something else on the throne of my life. And the beauty of this picture is Jesus who died so that we could come back strong from every setback of sin. Jesus says, yes, Peter, you've denied me, but I died for you to bring grace because I love you, I'm for you, I'm not done with you, I've, got still, I've still got work for you to do, I haven't given up on you. He looks at us and he says, yes, your priorities get out of whack, yes, you love your phone and your money and your relationships ahead of me sometimes, but I still love you. And that should cause us to run to Jesus, to renew and rededicate ourselves to him. Because when you understand the goodness of God's grace, you don't run from it. You don't abuse it. You run toward it. Because he's the only one who can do something about our brokenness. You see, the picture that we get left with is not Peter in the courtyard denying Christ. It's Peter on the beach eating breakfast with Jesus who says, Peter, I went to the cross so that I could give you grace. I give grace, not grace to be abused, but grace to be used. And maybe, maybe that's where our story intersects this story. 
Maybe that's where I start to remember what grandmother's pound cake smells like and tastes like because I realize, wait a minute, I can go back to this story. And I can tell you what Peter felt. I can tell you what that moment was like as Peter became aware of the grace that Jesus was offering. And maybe Jesus has been put on trial in your life. And kind of like Peter, you didn't know it at the moment, but you were the one on trial. And maybe you denied him and maybe you allowed an idol to sit on the throne of your life. And maybe you never realized it. Or maybe like Peter, at some point you did and you wept and you were afraid it was all over because you'd done too much and gone too far. Jesus died so that you could come back strong from that. Jesus died so that wouldn't be the last picture of your life. He went to the cross so that we could be forgiven. It takes deciding to follow Jesus like Peter did. It takes running to the one who can save us, the only one who can save us. And maybe this morning you're ready to make that decision. To say, you know what, I'm going to decide to follow Jesus. I'm going to repent of my sins. Like Peter, you realize what you've done. And it causes you to weep to say, if I could only do that over again, I would never. I want to live for Jesus. And you're looking for that moment. If Jesus would just ask you, do you love me? You'd say, oh, yes, Lord, I do. Maybe this morning you're ready to repent of your sins and confess your faith. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you'll live out that confession day in and day out. And you can be baptized to have your sins washed away. The gospel is for you. And at that moment, you can put on Christ, become a Christian. Maybe it's time to take that first step. Or perhaps you're a child of God. And somewhere along the way, you took Jesus off the throne of your life and something else became more important. And you began to serve it. And you look at your life and you say, oh no, I've messed up and I'm so sorry. And you want to come back. Can I tell you that the Lord's invitation is always open to come to him or to come back to him. If you need to get your life right with him, won't you come right now as we stand and sing? What a song of delight in the city so bright will be wafted beneath heaven's fair door. How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. again we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to come together this morning and worship you and sing praises to you father we ask that you continue to watch over those that were mentioned that were sick and be with those that are attending to them and we also ask that you be with those that have recently lost loved ones father we ask that you watch over us to 
the rest of this day until we meet again. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.